On, I want you to mark your calendars for September 17th. We have a special guest speaker coming into church. This is uh, a woman by the name of Joanne Spiller, and her specialty is she is, a, she is what's called a recreational gerontologist. What that means is, is she works with seniors and people who are um, transitioning from being completely independent to needing more support. And basically, she's going to be coming in and talking to uh, both seniors as well as um, adults with senior parents. Um, and she's going to be talking about some red flags to look out for when uh, trying to determine whether or not somebody needs more support. Um, she'll also be talking about what is the difference between long-term care and a senior's residence and waiting times and so on. Uh, so there's a lot of very important information, and she's going to be coming in on September 17th, so that's in three weeks, at 3.30 p.m., so in the afternoon. So please plan to bring your lunch, and um, there's a woman's Bible study right after lunch, and then our presentation will follow right after that. All right. Thank you. Um, my announcement, I have multiple announcements. I'll start with the one that's on the 18th, the day after. Um, the men who are interested in playing golf will be having our annual um, best ball golf tournament on Sunday at 9 o'clock. If you're interested, come see me after church, or, and, and I will give you all of the details. Um, second announcement is um, in regards to the sermon that ha we had last week, um, Pastor and I have been in discussion this week, and we're going to be starting a couple's ministry, actually two of them. Um, one of them is going to be led by Dylan and Lorianne. Is that a surprise, Lorianne? I think, I think we talked, Lori. Um, Lori, raise your hand, and Dylan is around. And, and then the other one's going to be led by me. And you notice, and Amanda. Yeah, we're working on it. Um, We're such a great couple. Yeah. See, we so, need it. Yeah. So the reason we have two different groups, because we're in two different generations, and we have two different sets of issues that we're dealing with or we're working through. Um, there are certain things that overlap, but um, we want to make sure that we have things that are very relevant to both um, an older, more mature age group and a younger age group that's starting out with young children. So we're going to be having two things um, running in parallel. Um, you're going to see some notifications for this starting up um, in September, um, um, but I just wanted to warn you ahead of time that you need to prepare your brain around it. Um, in preparation, I looked up a tip this morning that I want you to share this week or to, to put into practice this week. Um, this is from Kate Kuzma, Power Tips for Marriage. Um, I did not write this, so when, when you hear the title, it wasn't me who came up with it. It says, treat your husband like a dog. <laughs> and I said, really? Treat your husband like a dog. Um, I can't, re I like, I can't see that, that, but I remember what it says. Um, it says, treat your husband like a dog. It says, if you've ever trained a dog, you know that the dog is very um, eager to please you, and they will do anything to get the reward. So your husband or your wife seeks that reward. It says, um, many wives, without thinking, give more attention to the husband's faults, and the result is the reinforcement of the very things they don't like. So begin to in encourage the positive. Let him know, let him overhear you telling some, someone positive about him and give him plenty of um, nonverbal um, strokes of attention, hugs, a wink, a smile. Husbands like dogs will repeat the good things if they continue to get the reward. So this week, treat your husband like a dog. <laughs> Have a blessed Sabbath. Oh, one last thing. Um, for those of you who... Um, heard my announcement last week. We thank you. We have enough people to go out and feed um, the, the disadvantaged population in Hamilton this afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Huh. Does that mean Alicia's come out, Len?
Um, as, uh, as summer comes to a close, actually, our church is starting to, to wind up, to gear up, and uh, the programs are, are coming back. And uh, so today, um, we're going to Chartwell, right, Eduardo, and we're singing today? No? Okay. Same so, oh, same weekend. Oh, okay. You missed that one text. <laughs> so let, me, let me clarify. Come September 17th, uh, I think it's the 18th, actually, yeah, 17th. Uh, the Sabbath, we'll be going to Chartwell and singing again um, to the seniors and that. So if you'd um, like to know more about that, just talk to Eduardo and he'll, he'll set you up there. Um, but also the Pathfinders will do in their camping weekend that weekend, I do believe. The 17th to 19th, they're going to a park um, for camping. And uh, so just, again, if, if you haven't yet signed up for that, sign up with the, with the Pathfinder department. Um, starting September 10th, so that's roughly only two Sabbaths away, I think at 2 o'clock. I am not your women's ministry department, just for clarification. <laughs> but they have asked me to do an announcement for them because uh, they couldn't make it. Uh, the women's Bible study, um, uh, it's being put on by the women's uh, ministry department. It's geared, one of our uh, elders is working on some studies, Bible studies, that will help address the issues or the challenges of being a woman, a mother, a wife, whatever it may be, and, and living in this world, in, this busy, in the busyness and that. So I can't give you any more, but I know it's going to be a good program as, I, as I've been speaking with Laura and that. So that'll start on, uh, oh, sorry, September 7th to not. It should be 10th, though. The, the, in the bulletin, it's wrong, I think, because it says September 7th, but it should be the 10th. To October, starting after church. So they, I think their the plan is that you encourage with a bring a, a snack lunch and then uh, two thirty ish. I think it'll be starting, and that um, the there's one more um, a seniors event in October. We'll keep you posted on that. It is in in our bulletin. If you're not on the email for the bulletins, folks, just uh, talk to myself, and uh, I'll get Boyan to um, include you, um, and that. They normally come out Thursday nights unless we have a server glitch and that. Uh, today's speaker um, will be Pastor Richard Perrant. He's been here before. Uh, he's a good friend of ours. Uh, retired pastor, but doesn't stop his work. He's, uh, him and his wife were both uh, missionaries too overseas for very, uh, several years and that. So we look forward to, again, uh, both Richard and his wife, Elizabeth. I don't know where she's, there she is, still in the back. Uh, she's here too. And that, so welcome, and we look forward to hearing uh, the message that you have brought with us for us today. As we transition to our worship service, let me just read from uh, a couple of verses, shall I say, from our Sabbath school lesson, uh, Psalm 145, Song of Praise. Let me read it, uh, just verses 9, um, 9 through 12. The Lord is so good is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He, is, he has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. May the Lord be with us as we worship him today. Good morning, church. <clears throat> Happy Sabbath. It's so nice to see so many faces here this morning. Um, it's an honor for us to be leading out in worship. And so we're not, we're just leading. We're inviting you to participate with us. And we'd like to, actually, the, the musical theme today is about creation and um, God's um, worth and his glory. And so we want to um, kind of focus on a few things. And one is that we're here to celebrate 
<clears throat> creation and God's greatness in it. We are here also to celebrate um, uh, gratitude for the things that he has done for us. And we're also here to celebrate love because he loved us first. And we um, uh, love him. He sacrificed, because he sacrificed his life for us, he died for us so that we can live. And so that is an amazing thing. I love that amen. Thank you. Can anyone say, everyone say amen to that? Amen. And so as we say amen, and I heard everyone say amen, if you're able to say amen, you can also sing. Okay, let's join in as we sing God and King. of our God and King, lift up your voice to Him and sing. song but very meaningful very worshipful it's declaring that God is worthy he does all things I mean it to be um, to honor him and to glorify him in those things so we'd like you to I know this might be new for many of you but we'd like you to listen to Janet as she leads in the first verse Yo 
this now as we sing our final hymn, final song. <clears throat> you know, Jesus, God said that he's the only constant in life's changes. He's our peace. He's our comfort. He said, you cannot carry your burdens. You cannot carry your pain, your hurt, your sorrows, your disappointment, your guilt, your shame. You cannot carry that alone. Release it to me and hear my voice so that I can give you peace. My child, you are so busy way too busy in the midst of all the noise all the daily noise you can't hear me and so I ask you please my child just be still and hear my voice
God has brought us through another week, and here we are together in his house of worship. And I pray that he is accepting our worship. I pray that he helps us now come forward to him and being honest in him in our prayer of our needs and also of all the gratitude we have for him. I ask that you prepare yourself now as we are going to be coming to him in prayer. pain or suffering, I just want you to realize it could be a lot worse. Um, if you have a prayer request, please come up. And we'll pray to God together. Uh, I want to remember John Chopik. Uh, he had a small operation. They had to take a, a small tumor from his leg from skin there. Let's remember Michelle, of course, Maha's mother. I have a friend uh, who has cancer right now, actually in the hospital. That's where my wife is right now. Um, pray for her. For those that can, let's just kneel down. God, Lord, today we are in your presence, in your church, in your home. And Lord, everyone is struggling with something right now. God, we have our burdens, the things that keep us up at night, Lord. Whether it's our children who might be drifting away from the church or from us. Whether it's loved ones who are slowly getting sicker. 
whether it's ourselves, Lord, and problems at work or in our relationships or at school. Whatever it is, Lord, it's, it's things that we're pretty much powerless against. And so we come to you, Lord. We come to you as the creator of this universe, as the creator of life and of every human being, Lord. We come to you as the savior of this world, the redeemer of this world. We come to you because you're the only one who has the power to change directions, Lord, in our lives and of those around us. God, be with everyone that's sick. Be with Michelle, Darlene, be with John. And everyone else, Lord, that's also going through treatments, going to hospital. Lord, be with all the youth of our church, from the elder to the, the smallest ones, Lord. God, they're being raised up in a time of Earth's history, Lord, that is so confusing and so difficult, Lord. So be with them. Be with the parents. Be with their friends and everyone that has influence over their lives, Lord, and guide them in the right direction. Lord, I also want to lift up Ermgard. And what she's going through, Lord, in, in her own personal life. Pray for Shirley and Raymond Merchant, Lord. I want to pray for Lorianne and Dylan and little Declan, Lord, and for their lives, Lord, for the steps that they're taking, Lord, the difficulties that they're facing. Be with the Malavanov family, Lord, J George and Gail and Michael. Help them, Lord, through their difficult times, Lord, through their struggles. Be with Bronte, Lord. Be with Bronte to be the church that you want it to be, full of people that you want them to be, Lord, so that we can truly be the lights here, not just to ourselves, Lord, but outside to the community, to those around us, God. Be with all the different ministries that are going on, Lord, all the outreach that's going on. And just be with us, God, because you're all that we have. But that's enough. So be with us, God. Be with everyone here that's at the front with their own personal prayers, God. I just want to leave everything in your hands. I pray this, God, in your holy name. Amen. This week will be to the Ontario Conference.
Good morning and happy Sabbath, everybody. What? I didn't hear anything. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everybody. That's better. I'm happy to see all of you guys today. I've got a wonderful story to tell you about a little boy named Sam. Sam lived close to the ocean with his mother, his father, and his sister. But I'll tell you something about Sam. Sam was one of those boys that always wanted the best of everything. He always wanted the biggest and the best of everything. So one day he was with his family and they were by the ocean and they were digging for shells and they found four shells and one was bigger than the rest. And Sam said, I want that one. I want the big one. Uh, his family said, okay, Sam, here you go. Because he always asked for the biggest and the best. Well, when they were going back to the car, they heard the ice cream truck. You guys know what the ice cream truck sounds like? Yeah, we all know that song. And we go running to mommy or daddy. Can I buy an ice cream? Well, Sam and his sister did the same thing. And they said, can we get ice creams? So they stopped at the ice cream truck. And the ice cream man said, I have four ice creams, but one's a little bigger. Who do you think said they want that one? It was Sam. I want the big one. I want the big one. The family just sighed and said, okay, Sam, here you go. You can have the big one. Well, on their way home, Sam's mom decided, you know what? I need to teach my son a lesson. So she told her kids, kids, you can play in the yard until supper's ready. So she went to the kitchen and prepared supper, and then she called everyone to the table. So at the table... There were four glasses, one was a little bigger. There were four plates of food, one was a little bigger. There were four desserts, one was bigger. And there were four fruits, and one was bigger. So mom asked for their help to give out the food. Sam, can you help me put the food out? And Sam said, okay, but I want the bigger glass of juice. Okay, Sam, you can have the glass. And how about the food? Sam said, I want the big plate, even bigger than his father's plate. He said, wow, this kid can eat. Well, we'll see. Mom said, okay, Sam, you can take the bigger plate. And they passed out all the food. And Sam took the biggest of everything. Well, now it was time for grace. And his sister took the grace, and now it was time to eat. Sam was very happy that he had the biggest plate and the biggest glass. So he started eating his food. I said, Ugh, Mom, this food is so salty. I can't eat it. She said, Oh, I'm so sorry, Sam, that it's salty and you can't eat it. Maybe you should try and drink something. He said, You're right, Mom. He took a big gulp from his big glass. Ugh, Mom, this drink is bitter. Well... I'm sorry, Sam. Sorry you don't like the taste of it. Maybe you should try something else to eat. Maybe your dessert. And mom had made four apple pies, and one was bigger than the rest. So Sam said, okay, mom, I'll try the apple pie. He grabbed his fork. He was all happy. He was going to get into his apple pie. He dug in the middle. Oh! Lapsed. There was nothing... My pie empty. Let's try the fruit. And there were four apples. One was really big and the other were kind of small. Sam said, okay, I'm going to get the last big one. So Sam grabbed the big apple and he bit into it. <gasps> Yucky. There was a big worm in his apple. My goodness, Sam started to cry. He said, Mommy, everything I had today was wrong. My dinner was salty, my drink was bitter, my dessert was empty, and my apple had a worm. What did I do wrong? Mommy turned to Sam and said, Sam, sometimes you have to let other people get the choice. Other people, and share with others. It's not always good to take the best for yourself, but it's always good to give to others first and think of yourself second. So Sam said, you know what, Mom? I'm going to try that. I won't be greedy next time. 
So that is our lesson today, to share with others and put others first. Would anybody like to pray for us? Thank you, Jesus, for, for the animals. Thank you for... for uh, Everything. Amen. Amen. Thank you, too. Our scripture reading today is taken from Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 to 7. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. Then Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them by their tunics out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and to Ithamar, his sons, Do not uncover your heads, nor tear your clothes, lest you die, and wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord has kindled. You shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. The stars 
Thank you so very much. What a marvelous message about our awesome creator God and redeemer God. We have so much to praise him for. It's so good to be with you, such a lovely congregation. Uh, greetings to you and those who are tuned in online, a warm welcome to one and all. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Elder Heacock, for the invitation to share God's word with you today. That is a beautiful privilege. Strange fire, holy fire. Let us pray as we get into our subject. Dear Father in heaven, we pray that you will speak to us today. May your word reach in the inner recesses of our hearts and lead us to ever higher ground, we pray. So bless us. I'm a weak instrument, but Lord, I pray that your message will ring true to our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As you know, the children of Israel were wandering through the wilderness and God wanted to abide with them, and so he had them build the sanctuary, which is really a wonderful representation of the plan of salvation. And then as he would guide them, you'd have that pillar of fire by night or a cloud by day so that they would be sheltered from the burning sun. 
that pillar of fire would move on. So they would move on, it would stop, they'd stop somewhere, and then they'd set up camp. And then the fire of God would light the brazen altar in the outer court, and that was the holy fire that came down from God. And the priests had been trained that they're to use that sacred fire, bring it in the sanctuary, light the branch, the seven branch lampstand, light the golden altar of incense. But Aaron's sons, and Aaron was Moses' brother, the high priest, his sons were trained on how to do this, but they'd been drinking. And instead, they brought a fire of their own kindling. And this is the first DUI you find the Bible, dancing under the influence. And there they were partying, and the fire of God came down and burned them up. And Aaron was told not to grieve about it publicly, as if God had done something wrong. They knew what they had done. It's a sobering passage we read earlier, troubling in many ways. But just like John the Baptist preparing a people for the Lord's return, we are to be sober and awake at this time, aren't we? And Paul picks up on this. I should say, let's read the rest of the story in Leviticus. Then the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that you may distinguish between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean, and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord your God has spoken to them by the mouth of Moses. So Paul picks up on this, he says, and do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So there's a better option. Rather than be intoxicated with wine or anything else, be filled with the Spirit. It'll give you a different kind of high, one which will not leave you hungover, but one in which you'll be truly blessed. You have the fruit of the Spirit in your life. It'll transform you. Powerful. Now, is the Holy Spirit a person or a commodity? For some people, I'm afraid many Christians, it would be the second, a commodity, something you can use. And so some of them will say the problem with the church today is that it needs to be this just doesn't have enough of the Holy Spirit. But I would say, no, the problem with the church today is that the Holy Spirit doesn't have enough of us. We haven't really surrendered. And Christ has said that God is willing to give his spirit much more willing than we are willing to give good gifts to our children. And it is absolutely essential that we be filled with the spirit. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses 6 to 9, for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now what is carnally minded? That's where I'm ruled by my own passions, my degenerate heart, my selfish motives. That leads to death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because a carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God. It will not submit to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. Sounds pretty categoric, but it's a bit like Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born of water and of the spirit to inherit the kingdom of God absolutely essential. I'm going to be turning to the book of Revelation, and you might wonder, how does this fit into what we've been talking about? Please be patient with me. It'll become clearer as we go a little further. It's actually in Revelation chapter 13. That's the chapter that talks about the beast of Revelation, the number 666, 
Again, what does this have to do with anything? We're going to talk about another beast. In chapter 13, verses 11 to 14. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, whatever we're talking about here, it is a worldwide power that can compel people around the world to worship the beast of Revelation. And he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Wow. Makes fire come down from heaven. What is that about? Star Wars? Again, be patient with me. We get our first hint of what this might be about in 1 Kings chapter 18. In verse 19, Elijah says, now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Okay, so bring them all there, 850 pagan prophets, and there's going to be a showdown, 850 against one true prophet of God. And this is going to be a very fair battle, if you can say that. We'll even take it in the domain of Baal, because Baal was known as the god of fire. And if you found statuettes of Baal, usually you would find in the right hand a lightning bolt, because this was a god of fire. And we're going to take it in his domain, in his forte. See if these 850 prophets can get Baal to bring fire down from heaven and light the sacrifice. And they did everything they could to make it happen. They called out to him. They pleaded with him. They danced for him. They cut themselves for him, and nothing happened. They're exhausted. And finally, what happens? Elijah simply prays, and a fire comes down. You know the story. Devours the sacrifice, barocks everything. Fire came down from heaven. Interesting. Beast of Revelation 13 comes out of the earth, will bring fire down from heaven. Is this a counterfeit to the true? And then in the New Testament, Acts chapter 2, Pentecost happens. And the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus' close followers. And there's cloven tongues of fire over each head. Could we expect at the end of time a counterfeit Pentecost? Interesting. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, there are four beasts who come up out of the sea. An angel explains to Daniel, these are four kingdoms. One will follow the other. You know this stuff, so I'm going through it quickly. And the first one was a lion with a pair of wings. Clearly, comparing to Daniel 2, represents Babylon. It'll be followed by a second kingdom, represented by a bear, also coming up out of the sea, one side higher than the other, and that would be the second kingdom, Medo-Persia. And then comes a third kingdom, described like a leopard with four wings, super fast, and four heads. And of course, that would be Alexander the Great and the Greeks who defeat the Medes and Persians. Alexander the Great, though quickly dies, not in battle, no one can say exactly what took him, he just died age 33, and his generals divided the empire into four, four generals. Hence the four heads. But then comes the fourth beast. Now this one might not have looked like Godzilla. We don't know what it looked like. It has ten horns, iron teeth, devours much flesh. But it too came up out of the sea, like all the others. Teeth of iron, just like the legs of iron. Clearly Rome. 
And then as Daniel 2 shows, feet of iron and clay, disintegration of the Roman Empire, ten toes just paralleling the ten horns of this beast, disintegration of the Roman Empire. Interesting. But in Revelation 13, verse 1, John describes seeing a beast coming up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Interesting. Now, how many heads does this beast have? Seven. How many heads did these four different beasts in Daniel 7 have altogether? Seven. <laughs> Interesting parallel. And then you talk about the horns. It talks about the leopard body, paws of a bear, mouth of a lion. All these things are coming directly from Daniel 7, aren't they? So the end time persecuting beast has elements coming from Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And you might wonder, well, what kind of stuff do we have coming from these kingdoms? Why are there 60 seconds in a minute? Why are there 60 minutes in an hour? It could have been 50, it could have been 100. When you do a full circle, why is that 360 degrees? It could have said 500, it could have said 1,000, 360. This all came from Babylon. We have so many elements coming from Babylon. 666, the number of Babylon the Great. Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 3 of Daniel builds an image. How tall? 60 cubits, 6 cubits wide. Again, 6, the number of Babylon. Come short of perfection, number 7. And then from Media Persia, we have a banking system we have today, uh, currency. And then from the Greeks, we have philosophy, which, I mean, we talk about Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. These are things taught in our universities, but also things that impact the Christian world. What they believe happens when people die. Hmm. Immortal souls. Okay, and then you've got from Rome, Roman law, military uh, organization. All of this we have from these four kingdoms. And it's impacting us today. And then in chapter 17, verse 15, we read, And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated, and she's seated on a beast, are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. So there will be many nations supporting this beast, just like there was for Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Popular support. Now, when we talk about a beast coming up out of the earth, it may not mean it comes from an unpopulated part of the world, but what we saw in these previous kingdoms were nations that were organized against the people of God, against the kingdom of God. And so this beast that comes up with lamb-like horns out of the earth and then speaks like a dragon, many have identified with the United States. Yes, it starts with lamb-like horns, promising freedom to all. It's what it sought. It has a wonderful constitution that has inspired democracy around the world. It certainly started lamb-like, but we're promised will become like a dragon. Now we'll see as we study a little further what developed in the United States that could be a false Pentecost. Now, before I go any further, this is not an attack on Pentecostals at all. When we were in Barstow, California for nine and a half years, I became a very close friend of a minister of the Assemblies of God, which is the largest Pentecostal body in the US, Chris Santiago. We're almost neighbors, just two blocks apart, but we became almost inseparable, prayed together, counseled together, Chris and his wife Zulma to the Grand Canyon were invited to his ordination. He had been a Marine for many years, later in life became a minister. This is not an attack on Pentecostals. 
but we're going to be addressing issues that they've had to look at, but we more and more are having to look at in our own denomination. It's impacting us too. So please take it in that light. Now I'm going to be quoting a lot from this book, from which I got the title, Strange Fire, Holy Fire, written by Michael Klassen. On page 44, and he's a Pentecostal, he wrote, Charismatics and Pentecostals trace their origins to January 1, 1901, the first day of the 20th century when Agnes Osman, who was 30 at the time, became the first person in modern age to speak in tongues. Now, these are Pentecostals telling you that's where it started. Now, if you want to be 100% historically correct, it started about five years earlier in 1896, actually in the Carolinas, when a small group started speaking in tongues there. But that didn't continue from that group. It really sparked in 1901 with this Agnes uh, Osmond. A student in Charles Parkham's Bethel Bible College in Topeka, Kansas, Agnes Osmond reportedly spoke in Chinese for three days, unable to communicate in English. So he's not talking some heavenly language, she's talking an earthly language, must have been Mandarin. Frustrated by her inability to converse with her instructor and fellow students, she tried expressing herself in writing, only to scribble in Chinese as well. Now, is this miraculous? Absolutely. Something pretty special happened there. Hmm. Now, around the very same time, Ellen White had something to say. It's found in Second Selective Messages, page 36. The things you have described as taking place in Indiana back in 1900, she says, the Lord has shown me would take place just before the close of probation. Every uncouth thing will be demonstrated. There will be shouting with drums, music, and dancing. This what she was seeing coming in a short while. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. And this is called the moving of the Holy Spirit, pure emotionalism. The Holy Spirit never reveals itself in such methods and in such bedlam of noise. This is an invention of Satan to cover up his ingenious methods for making of none effect the pure, sincere, elevating, ennobling, sanctifying truth for this time. Interesting caution, but it's to happen among us. Charles Spurgeon, who lived at the same time, said the time will come when instead of shepherds feeding sheep, they will have clowns entertaining the goats. <laughs> Interesting way of saying it. But he expected things will degenerate spiritually. Have they? Now, to be historically accurate, spiritual gifts started taking interesting forms earlier. In AD 155, this is another exception. About 100 years after Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, where he talks about spiritual gifts, there was a pagan priest from Phrygia, present-day Turkey, and his name was Montanus. He converted to Christianity. Now, that sounds good. Following his conversion, Eusebius, the early church historian, reported that Montanus raved and began to babble in utter strange things, prophesying in a manner contrary to the constant custom of the church handed down by tradition from the beginning. Strange things were happening. He's babbling, prophesying. And Mountainous declared a new era of the Holy Spirit with new power, prophetic leadership, and a greater commitment to living holy lives. So two women joined Mountainous, forming a trinity of prophets who proclaimed that their prophecies superseded the authority of scripture. That should be a red flag, right? The Bible tells us that prophets are subject to the prophets. That's in 1 Corinthians 14. Whatever people claim to pro profess from God must be tested by scripture. Prove all things, Paul says. In fact, he praised the Bereans 
for testing everything he was preaching to them by the scriptures. Now, we traditionally have been people of a book, but are we inclined to be caught up with some of this emotionalism and to listen to people who are saying things that are not exactly biblical? Remember what happened with Jim Jones. He cast the Bible aside and preached to the people, and they followed him, followed him to their death, over 900 of them, right? Jonestown, Guyana. Tragic. But then closer to home, David Koresh, in the Branch Davidians of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Branch Davidians target Adventists they feel will be responsive to their message. And what happened? Waco, Texas. This summer I read this interesting book, In the Wake of Waco. Now Texans might tell you, Waco stands for we ain't coming out. But anyhow, aside from that, the subtitle, why were Adventists among the victims? Why were we? Because we, a people of a book, we're not proving all things. We're taken in. Have there been abuses of power in the charismatic world? I won't read all the details, but in some mega churches, there's this pastor, and this is a few decades ago, was being paid $750,000 a year. You have to multiply that by three or four now. And living in a $1.4 million home, that'd be like $4 million home gated community, driving luxury vehicles, flying in church-owned jet. And he would channel real estate money to his uh, daughter-in-law, and then more money would go to his third wife and son for uh, business dealings. Decades ago, financial controversies involving charismatic luminaries like Oral Roberts and Jim Baker, Jimmy Swaggart, totally rattled the evangelical world. These people were looked up to. And yet, hypocrisy to the extreme, right? Scandalous living and ah, how the money was used. Following their footsteps, Richard Roberts, Oral Son, Credo Dollar, and Joris Meyer have come under scrutiny in recent years. Now, in this book by Klassen, he tells us about Thomas Freeling. He spent 10 years working uh, as a publisher for a charismatic publishing company. And during his tenure, he worked directly with many of the charismatic media personalities we know and love. Now, the amount of money that flows into some of these nonprofit ministries is unbelievable, he comments. Most of the people on Christian television live very opulent lifestyles. He says, I once visited a famous tele-evangelist who ordered room service in his hotel in order to avoid meeting crowds. He ordered multiple items of the most expensive food on the menu, more than he could ever eat, and after he ate his fill, he threw most of it away. Freeling says, people in these circles charge all of their everyday expenses to the ministry. So if that meal costs three or four hundred dollars, no big deal. Throw it away. Interesting. One televangelist's wife told me, he says, if I wear an outfit on television just once, I can charge it to the ministry. And then they charge all their travel expenses to the ministry, including their vacations. Their ministries even own their multi-million dollar homes, some with as many as 18,000 square feet. It's amazing. Now imagine for a moment that you are a tele-evangelist. Feels pretty good, doesn't it? And a major publisher has just printed and released your most recent book, My Riches at Christ's Expense. Which you'd like to sell, no, I mean, which you'd like to make available to your TV audience. Now instead of purchasing your book through your ministry, your for-profit business purchases 50,000 copies of a book from the publisher at a 70% discount for a volume. It costs you only $6 a book. And then you turn around and you sell that book for a full retail price of $19.99 to your nonprofit ministry, which is supported by the gifts of local loyal supporters. 
And by selling the books through your for-profit business, you have profited almost $700,000. Time to write another book, isn't it? Interesting how that works. Hmm. In charismatic circles, spiritual leaders are not to be questioned. Don't ask them questions about how much money they make. A favorite text for them is found in Hebrews 13, and it's uh, verse 17. It says, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch over your souls, for your souls, as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. Interesting passage. It's from the Bible. But they're saying, don't you question us? That wouldn't be good. When Paul wrote this, he's talking about a time when people were being locked up in prison for sharing God's love. When people get stoned, left for dead, beaten, whipped. He's saying, don't give them a hard time. He's not talking about these characters. Now, Pentecostalism reaffirmed the gift of prophecy beginning in the 1900s. And by 1980s, independent charismatic churches began establishing the office of prophet. Yes, I've met people in California who'd say, not I'm pastor so-and-so, I'm prophet so-and-so. And then later on, it became, I'm apostle so-and-so. Interesting titles. Now, J. Lee Grady, the editor of Charisma Magazine, which is a charismatic magazine, once traveled to China to interview leaders in the house church movement. Now, one woman told Grady that she oversees 5,000 churches in a rural area. That makes her pretty important. Are you a bishop or an apostle, Grady asked, trying to understand the terms they use. Oh, we do not use titles, she replied. Uh, we just call each other brother or sister. Yeah. The truth is, men and women with spiritual authority don't need a title to be used by God. They don't. Jesus said, ye are the light of the world. Let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You don't need a title to do that. You've been called. You don't even need a church office to do that. You've been given spiritual gifts that you can use for the master. And then we read in Matthew 20, verses 25 to 28, but Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Yes, what an example he's given us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 12, Paul condemns people who consider themselves super apostles. Yeah, we're more important than Paul or Peter or any of these. We are super apostles. And these fellows, as Paul writes, were powerful preachers, and they had great sway over the churches. And Paul says, I'm just an untrained speaker, someone who makes a living making tents. Yeah, what am I? Yeah, at times it's not good to just follow the uh, loudest voices, but here's a temptation. Why should I fast and pray, seeking to discover God's will for my life, when I can go to a prophet who'll tell me what to do? Or why should I pay the price for an ever-deepening relationship with Jesus when I can take advantage of someone else's relationship? <laughs> There's some favorite phrases among charismatics, like we don't need no education. Russ Spittler, that would be uh, Klassen's seminary professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, once lamented to Christianity Today about his experience with his Pentecostal denomination. 
In the Assemblies of God, when we apply annually for credentials, you have to identify your ministry, either pastor, chaplain, missionary, evangelist, or other. For years, I had to check other. I was always an other because a teacher is not highly respected, so it's not even on the list. If the Holy Spirit is teaching you, why would you have any regard for this or that teacher, right? And there's been a traditional contempt for formal education claiming that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Of course, that comes from the Bible. 1 Corinthians 8, 1, knowledge puffs up. So education is not good for you. Now, Paul was really addressing the problem of Gnosticism, a belief that salvation can be based on acquiring some hidden knowledge. Come to you, come to me, I'm your guru, and I'll give you the keys to finding salvation. That kind of knowledge, gnosis in Greek, puffs up, but love builds up. So, you know, Paul is not demeaning the importance of a solid biblical education. After all, he was trained to be a Pharisee of Pharisees. But he's putting down this faulty knowledge that promises what it can't deliver, salvation. So there's one of the catchphrases. We don't need no education. A second one, if it's strange, it must be of God. Okay? If it's really an odd thing, it's got to be God doing this. Now, Smith Wigglesworth would be a great example of this. He was a famous healing evangelist from the first half of the 20th century, early 1900s. He had an unconventional approach to healing because he believed that praying for a sick man was an act of spiritual warfare. He often punched the people who were sick in the afflicted area with his fist, believing he was actually striking the devil. So if you said, you had an upset stomach, watch out, it's coming, right there in the belly. You have a headache, bang, your ear, don't even tell him about your eye, right? He'll just whack it. That's interesting. And holy laughter, which Pentecostals started calling the joy of the Lord or laughing in the spirit in the early years and barking like a dog, took charismatics by storm during the Toronto blessing. It started right next door here. And a year later, the Brownsville Revival introduced us to twitching, jerking, and waving our arms in the air, yelling, more Lord, more Lord. So these are the kind of things that were going on. And as if to up the ante, gold dust began appearing on foreheads, and worshipers began having gold fillings materialize on some of their teeth. Supernatural stuff, yes. Yeah, so if it's weird, it must be of God. And then there's wild new teachings. Many charismatics have an insatiable appetite for a fresh word, something that no one has ever said before. For example, Christians are little gods. You're not going to find that in the Bible. You're not going to find that ever said in 1800. It's only now that this is being taught. Christians are little gods. And connected to that, another teaching, it would say, our words create. Since God could create, as we heard in that beautiful song, just by speaking it, our words, because we're little gods, can also create. Another teaching, each person of a trinity is composed of another smaller trinity. Again, where did that ever come from? But that's a new teaching. Paul wrote this in Galatians 1, verses 6 to 8. I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. It's not really a gospel. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. So if it's Wild and new, it may not be the thing you should entertain. Here are some favorite catchphrases. Name it and claim it. Believe it and receive it. Confess it and possess it. Blab it and grab it. Classen goes on. 
He's talking about the word of faith movement, which is a new development now in Pentecostalism. The word of faith movement codifies that belief into a principle or law. Charismatics believe that God has the power to heal. I also believe that, don't you? God has the power to heal. But word of faith people believe that God wants everyone healed now. Okay, you're to expect it. Charismatics believe that God can multiply back to you the financial gifts you invest into his kingdom. Word of faith people believe that God will multiply back to you the gifts which you invest into his kingdom. It's bound to happen. Charismatics believe that God can help you get that job over the other six applicants. Word of faith people believe that God will get you that job. And then you overcome sickness by confessing that by Jesus' stripes, you are healed. I knew a lady in the park we were living in there in California, really bad cold. By his stripes, I am healed. Okay, so you're supposed to quote that, and you'll be well. And if you can't find a parking space, you pray, Dear Lord Jesus, full of mercy and grace, please find me a parking space. And it'll happen, okay? Just believe it. The Word of Faith movement has even gone mainstream evangelical. People who don't even pray in tongues proclaim that if we pray the prayer Jabez and really believe it, then God will grant our requests, okay? And you find mention of that in what, 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10, prayer Jabez. Now, don't let the fact that Jesus never prayed this prayer or that his heavenly father didn't keep Jesus from all pain or that Jabez's prayer is mentioned only once in scripture prevent you from repeating this matter, I mean, from standing on this prayer. Don't let that bother you. Now, we all want God's blessings, don't we? Now, most of us might define a blessing as receiving $10 million gift or a new luxury car or getting lots of stuff, elimination of pain. But is that what it's really about, God's blessing? The Lord says something startling in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God doesn't think the way we do. The God I know, however, doesn't seem so enamored with accumulating stuff and avoiding pain. In fact, he gave us his only son, who then suffered a terribly painful death on the cross. Hmm. No, that's what he went through. Unhealthy parents will just give their kids whatever they want, think it'll eliminate pain. But insistent children who get everything they want wind up being spoiled brats and eventually broken adults. You can't just throw money at a problem and call that a blessing. Classen says, years ago, I dabbled in the Word of Faith movement. I enjoyed listening to -to down-to-earth teachers like Kenneth Hagin and Kenneth Copeland. In the Word of Faith movement, we never asked God to reveal his will. We decided his will for ourselves, and then we expected God to answer our prayers. In fact, we were taught that the ultimate faith killer in prayer was a phrase, God, if it's your will. You're never to say that, okay? Interesting. Perhaps we didn't want to know his will because it didn't agree with ours. So we decided to stop asking him and start telling him, or is it that demanding of him what we wanted? Now, when we went to Andrews University back in the early 80s, just off campus, there was an Adventist church, and there was a lady there who was definitely sick of cancer. She had a devoted husband, two loving teenage children, and the pastor determined this woman will not die of cancer. And so he rallied people who will agree that we will pray and God will heal. There will be no seeking God's will. And they prayed around this woman, gathered around the family, and they prayed and insisted God heal this woman. And she died. How devastating that would be to those 
adolescent children wondering, was my faith not strong enough? God didn't heal her? Who are we to insist? Among the divine principles coming from the Word of Faith movement, we have when you give, God will return to you back tenfold or hundredfold. And what we, ha uh, we have what we say, so we must speak our desires into existence. God's word never returns void, so keep on confessing God's word over your situation until he answers your prayer. Now, I'm glad we've been studying about the crucible experience. This is so valid and true because this is very misleading. Now, you're going to be exempt from every kind of pain and sorrow and grief in this world. Not so. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth with a word. Let there be, as in let there be light. Now, the Hebrew word for that is haya, let there be. Building on this foundational premise, word of faith teachers instruct us that because we are created in the image of God, we create with our words as well. <laughs> Okay, you just have to speak it. It's going to happen. This is what they're saying. We need to be guarded and careful here. Because we have what we say, we better watch what we say. If we speak negativity, sickness, poverty, or doubt over our lives, we will suffer negativity, sickness, poverty, or doubt in our lives. On the other hand, if we speak positivity, health, wealth, and faith, we'll reap more of the same. Because a tongue has a power of life and death, Proverbs 18.21, it's biblical. We must be careful what we say. Now, when you read carefully the text, you find the Lord is cautioning you. Careful of the use of a tongue. A tongue can be bitter. It can really hurt someone, destroy someone, or it can be a great blessing. Careful how you use it. But no, they're using that text I'll say out of context to say your tongue has that power to create or destroy. Here's a little reminder of what and what not to say in case you get in, stuck in an elevator with someone from the Word of Faith movement. You must never say, I think I'm catching a cold. Rather say, I think I'm catching a healing. See, it's all turned around. And don't say, you make me sick, but rather say, you're a blessing to me. Don't ever say, I was just laid off from work, but rather say, God is positioning me for a fulfilling job which pays me more money than I've ever dreamed. Okay? Don't say we're going under, but say we're going over. Okay. Paul wrote 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 and 9. Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. What word is being emphasized here? Content, contentment. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish, harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Word of faith teachers tell us that we create. Our words create because we're created in God's image. We are God's children, little gods. Blasphemous? I'd say yes. Little or big, a god is a god. Either we are or we aren't. And if we're gods, when we really don't need God's wisdom in making decisions, don't we? I mean, we're gods. And if we're little gods, we really don't need anyone to save us. We really don't need Jesus. If Jesus' disciples were little gods, then they should and will get whatever they want. Yet Jesus taught them to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's part of the Lord's Prayer, right in the heart of it. Hmm. Remember in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. Eve is there by the tree of knowledge of good and evil. She knows she must not eat this fruit lest we die. 
And the serpent tells her, you shall not surely die. Go ahead. He actually says that God knows that the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you're going to become like God, knowing good and evil. That same longing to become like God we're being taught today in these word of faith teachers. Paul wrote this in 2 Timothy 4 verse 20. Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Now this is Paul who healed all kinds of people, even raised a young lad from the dead, but he left a co-worker, Miletus, sick. Or not Miletus, but Trophimus, sick in Miletus. This is Paul who prayed three times, Lord, if possible, take this born out of me, out of my flesh. No, no, my grace is sufficient. Paul didn't always get what he wanted. He couldn't just heal just anybody. It's as the Lord led and directed. Now, Closet says, when I was a senior in college, I served as a head chaplain in a dorm, around 200 men. Someone asked me to pray for another man in the building whose mother was deathly sick with cancer. I issued a call throughout the dorm for men to pray. Later that night, around 20 men showed up, including a young man whose mother was sick. And we spent the next hour or so in heartfelt prayer. With great fervency, we confessed every scripture we could remember that mentions healing. And we bound the powers of darkness and cursed the cancer. Adam, the young man with a sick mother, sat silently. At the conclusion of the meeting, I exhorted the men, we must need to pray through until Adam's mom is healed. What do you mean by pray through? Adam asked me afterward. You know, keep praying until God heals her. I was certain that God was going to heal her, especially because the whole Oral Roberts University campus was praying for her as well. I mean, if God can't work through the corporate prayers of a university founded by a healing evangelist, could he even heal at all? For him, he's really thinking, this has got to happen. A few days later, Adam's mother died. We did everything, we, everything right. We prayed fervently, spoke the word over her, and called the things that are not as though they were, and yet she died. Later, I heard that Adam asked the wing chaplain, if Mike said all we need to do is pray through, and we prayed through, then why did she die? My heart aches remembering the situation. Yeah. For sure. Does God always heal? We've seen in Paul's experience, no. But then although it was within his power to do it, Jesus did not save John the Baptist, his cousin, from being beheaded. Nor did he save himself from the cross. Nowadays, there are plenty of Bible promise books available. But one Bible promise conspicuously absent in all of them Yet straight from the lips of Jesus, our Savior, is this one. In the world, you will have tribulation. John 16, 33. That's a promise. Expect it. If you follow me, you'll have tribulation. But somehow we don't want to think of those promises. We read in Hebrews 2, verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through what? Sufferings. Jesus, the captain of our salvation, was made perfect through sufferings. Now, if it took sufferings to mature and perfect him. You think we can be exempt from it and grow? Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, that I may know him. C.S. Lewis wrote, God whispers to us in our pleasures, 
speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God speaks loudest when we're going through trials and tribulations. Now, you could say that from experience. The woman he loved with all his heart died of cancer. He's saying, God spoke to me most when I went through all this heartbreak. Now, Klassen says some years earlier, his father, pastor of a church, there was a man writhing in anguish and pain, and, and so they started you know, casting out demons, doing whatever, applying the blood of Jesus, but the mumbling and pain continued. His father then realized that the man was in a diabetic shock. So someone called for an ambulance, and the man was taken to hospital. It just goes to show that not always there's a demon hiding under a bush. More than freedom from demonic possession, the man needed some orange juice. In fact, it seems to me that we give Satan way too much credit. Credit for what he wants, is that's what he wants, but he doesn't deserve. It's easier to blame Satan for a spirit of immorality or a spirit of gluttony than to shoulder the blame ourselves. Now, when I was in Barstow, California, about 10 years earlier, this would be like 30 years ago or so, there was a great healer coming from LA. He's coming to the large Assemblies of God Church and healing people left and right. And there was a young boy, I believe he's 11 years old, and he was a juvenile diabetic. And the healer said, you have been healed. You will not need to take insulin ever again. You're healed. And they believed him. The boy didn't take his insulin. In about three days, he was dead. Tragic. But to add to the tragedy, they then announced, no, no, no. He will raise on the third day. So on the day of the funeral, there are all kinds of TV cameras there waiting for a resurrection. It never happened. Never happened. This is crazy. What strange fire looks like. Need to wrap this up. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 24, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Watch out. Miracles galore. Paul wrote, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. And you can expect he will appear one day, Satan, impersonating Christ, healing people, and many will be deceived because they're not grounded in the word. Paul also wrote, and then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Again, coming back to our text, and he, the second beast, coming up out of the earth, performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So is this Star Wars? Someday it may include that until all prophecies are fulfilled. We can't be dogmatic. But could it be that in the United States there be birth to a counterfeit Pentecost? A counterfeit Pentecost, which brings all kinds of excitement and draws people away from being grounded in the word. Could that be the great deception? Consider all the miracles Jesus performed in his three and a half year ministry. Isn't it astounding how many apostles were with him as he hung on the cross? Only one, John, just one. And so signs may accompany those who believe, but they cannot be the bedrock of our faith how we need to have a living connection with Jesus. Be people of a book and know him personally. It's the only thing that will carry us through a time of deception such as there never was. If we have that growing relationship with Christ, we'll be able to say like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Is it your desire to have that kind of powerful living faith that you will trust him no matter what. Yes, say amen if that is your will. May God bless this one and all. 
Our closing hymn is number 341, To God Be the Glory. Testing, test, testing. This is a beautiful hymn. We need some help here, so uh, can we all please stand and sing to God be the glory, great things he has done. together. Oh, Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your word, such a guiding light. We thank you for your son who gave us all for us. And indeed, through his stripes, we are healed, made whole. And Father, we pray that you will help us to keep leaning on his everlasting arms, trusting him, abiding in him. And Lord, that we'll be sheltered from the great delusions that are expected to come to this world. So keep us, Lord, ever a people of the book who treasure your word and seek to abide in your light. Bless us one and all, we pray, and keep us ever following Christ, our wonderful Savior. In his name we pray, amen. <laughs>
right, just before we wrap up, uh, as everyone leaves, uh, one quick announcement. First, I want to just thank Pastor Richard here uh, for that message for us today, timely message. Uh, and also for next week, uh, it is Camp Frenda, so a lot of people aren't going to be here, including myself. So don't be scared that the rapture happened or something like that. Um, it's just that a lot of people will be at Camp Frenda. Uh, hopefully we can see you there. Uh, and if not, church is open, so come down and enjoy another service with us. God bless you all. Thank you again.